Hi, welcome to Narrowverse, a podcast hosted by Carolina and Clara, where we discuss all matters from neuroscience to philosophy and beyond. Today's episode is on sleep deprivation. Hmm, <laughs> what about it? So um, we'll be looking at whether sleep is required for survival and I guess what is the consequence of sleep deprivation. We all know that sleeping is bad for you or so no what? not sleeping <laughs> not sleeping in, in sufficient hours is bad for you yes or so we're told um, <laughs> but how is it actually bad for you no one's actually shown that sleep ca- lack of sleep can causally lead to death or anything like that and so really i think so which is why we're still trying to figure out why like it, it does lead to death but we don't know exactly what causes Causes it it. i think it's been shown in animals that have been tested experimentally that if you sleep deprive them they eventually die but yeah it's not understood why yeah they do eventually die yeah and (laughs) and also i doubt any human records have shown like cause of death sleep deprivation yeah Uh, as i know that i i i listened to this podcast by let's learn everything i think and they did an episode on sleep deprivation as well Mm. and the closest that they went with human trials and sleep deprivation it would lead to insanity yeah um and i i I think also maybe a few deaths but essentially overall physiologically we don't know how the dots are connected we don't know what is causative and what is a consequence yeah yeah i find it really interesting thinking about what the actual function of sleep is. I mentioned this in a previous episode on sleep and memory, Mm -hmm. um, but the fact that sleep puts us in a very vulnerable state Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, we're inactive and we're not responsive to the stimuli um, in the world around us, but yet every animal has been shown to sleep and humans spend around two-thirds of their lives sleeping. So it must have, like, a very important function yeah and exploring the the cause of sleep dep- deprivation dragana regulia's lab in harvard university did mm-hmm. some really interesting research with flies and mice and oh yeah because fruit flies are a commonly used animal to study neuroscience yeah and for for many other reasons i'm not going to get into mm-hmm. but like they're especially used to study sleep um because the clock genes that control circadian rhythms were actually discovered in fruit flies. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Dragana... Uh, Dragana Regulia. Dra- Dragana Regulia. I think. Yeah. I, I hope that I'm pronouncing it correctly. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, essentially, they, they conducted uh, the same experiments, uh, the experiment on flies and then later on on mice, but the results were the, sh- the same. They showed that after a significant amount of sleep deprivation, reactive oxygen species started to build up in the gut. Mm-hmm. And it's so interesting because you wouldn't think that the effect would be in the gut. Yes. I think a lot of us as humans think of sleep as a cognitive thing that happens yeah, in the brain. Exactly. Mm-hmm. It's it's so interesting. And it they they did try I I noticed that in the paper they tried to explain it it's in a way where they looked at all of the organs they tried to look at all of like the physiological processes happening and and the common factor and the thing that was most significantly affected was the gut Mm -hmm. with this buildup of react reactive oxygen species reactive oxygen species are it's an oxygen that has an unpaired electron and unpaired electrons are incredibly reactive and these are often found in several diseases and it's usually present in cancer it's often present in chromatid instability Mm -hmm. so uh, for example fragile x syndrome um as well as um huntington's disease all of these different it's so it's not a good thing reactive oxygen (laughs) species getting the point across yes exactly it's also associated associated with every single neurodegenerative disorder yeah exactly Yeah, so the fact that there is a massive buildup of reactive oxygen species in the gut um, led them to then try and answer the question, well, is this 
a product of the sleep deprivation or is this a consequence no sorry a, a, a causing a cause <laughs> a cause of death due to the sleep deprivation right so is the buildup of reactive reactive is the buildup of reactive oxygen species in the gut responsible for the death yeah that is caused by sleep, sleep deprivation? deprivation yeah is it the thing that links the two yes yeah they were trying to determine whether it's a cause or a consequence yes <laughs> simply put <laughs> yeah sleep loss um alters and dysregulates a lot of um redox states and lots of sleep regulating neurons in in the brain so in order to keep the flies or the mice sleep deprived they use um thermoregulation and thermogenetic stimulation of different neurons which get activated or deactivated due to temperature Ooh, yeah that's so interesting because i was just listening to a podcast about uh sleep with matthew walker who wrote the book why why we sleep i think it's called yeah which i have to confess i haven't read so i feel like i'm not qualified to talk about sleep but <laughs> but anyways i listened to a podcast yes. <laughs> and he was saying how temperature regulates sleep more than anything else does so including light exactly specifically light um so the reason that humans tend to wake up at dawn at dawn yeah, yeah at dawn is because it's at the point just when the temperature begins to rise which is actually before the sunrise mm. and yeah and how um he said we need to cool we need to warm up in order to cool down in order to fall asleep and then to stay asleep we need to stay cool mm. and to wake up we need to warm up yes it's it makes sense and it's so interesting but it feels at the same time so counterintuitive i feel like we have this idea about light and darkness and so going back to these genes um they tested um this cation channel called trip a1 which is activated by heat so at 21 degrees celsius this cation channel is closed but once the temperature rises above this point um it opens and at 29 degrees they they are open and it causes the neurons to be stimulated and this was what was used to keep the mice and the flies awake for several days so by keeping them warm by keeping them warm wow yeah i thought that they usually do sleep deprivation experiments by like constantly aggravating the animals yeah so I like know. with flies they like constantly move the test tubes that they're kept in so that they every time they're about to fall asleep they're being hit <laughs> yeah i mean just so horrible it is really it's horrible. really not a nice thing to study but i so i have read the paper and but i i didn't read it in depth and i i was thinking could a potential mechanism as to why sleep altered reactive oxygen species in the gut be because one major function of sleep is to activate uh the parasympathetic part of the autonomic nervous system so the autonomic nervous system is the nervous system that is responsible for involuntary action or involuntary mechanisms and um the parasympathetic system is the one that is responsible for rest and digest it's known mm. as and so whereas the sympathetic is more like arousal and stimulation so during sleep your parasympathetic system is activated and this has a major role in digestion oh. by stimulating the production of enzymes needed for digestion mm -hmm. so perhaps if you don't get sleep you're not having enough of this um, parasympathetic activation of digestion and by altering the enzyme composition in the gut maybe mm -hmm. this is linked to the buildup of reactive oxygen species that it's so interesting you say that because i think they did look at studies carried out with um so sleep deprived animals we usually associate uh them with having a higher metabolic activity um mm -hmm. due to the sleep deprivation and one of the um major sources of reactive oxygen species is um, in ATP synthase, which is involved in the citric acid um, cycle, and 
it it releases energy and it's where oxygen is used. They noticed that overeating was not a cause of reactive oxygen species consumption because they compared the these two different studies to rule eating as a cause of reactive oxygen species accumulation and therefore premature death, which I think kind of relates to what you were saying about whether or not... Wait, so overeating is linked to the accumulation of reactive... No, it's not, compared to what we assumed. So parasympathetic being involved with digestion is not necessarily the cause or plays a major role in reactive oxygen species accumulation, which then again indicates that it's a matter of the lack of sleep and not a matter of the metabolism. Does that make sense? Yes, but I was saying that sleep activates the parasympathetic system. Oh, oh, that's interesting. I don't know. That logic does make sense. I don't know what the, li- the literature is about this. So I guess it's interesting how there are these two different competing views and in a way it makes sense because sleep has not been solved yeah. and there's so many different contributing factors to what to how good or bad how good sleep is and how bad lack of sleep can be and what is the cause of death from lack of sleep yeah so it's interesting how it's always so much more complicated than we think it is <laughs> so i find it interesting the idea that sleep may be a function of the whole body in terms of its role in metabolism Mm. of the cells throughout the body, not just the brain, um, like here with the gut. But this, um, this, this reminded me of something that I read, which is that, um, a lot of people have over time been coming up with studies to, to try to detect sleep in different animals to see, do they really sleep? Mm. And um, it has been detected in animals that don't necessarily have a brain. Oh, nice. Such as hydra, which Mm. are a type of sponge. And they have a nervous system, but it's very basic and primitive and they don't have a brain. And they a study was able to detect sleep in them. And they studied differences in sleep regulation in these animals versus... um, other animals <laughs> and they they found that in hydra sleep is very homostatic so it's mm. linked to how much me- mechan- mechanical activity they display during the waking state so if they if they move more then they sleep more okay. which makes sense sleep is also found to be necessary for the proliferation of cells so uh-huh. like for growth mm. which also makes logical sense and they also found that dopamine Mm -hmm. which is a neurotransmitter that is necessary for arousal in like humans and most mammals and even the flies they found that dopamine in hydra was actually had the opposite function so an increase in dopamine was associated with inducing sleep oh interesting and so they hypothesized that there was a switch in um these sleep promoting pathways at some point in evolutionary development of yeah these species and that sleep's original role in these more archaic creatures was not cognitive like not to do with the brain yeah but was rather to provide a scenario in which metabolic functions can occur wow yeah that's so cool i think I can't remember another example, but I, I, I do think that there is a few cases where the regulatory pathway works in a specific way with like mammals. And then you look at a different species and like the same enzymes can have like the opposite, the opposite effect. Yeah. Yeah. It's super interesting. Mm-hmm. But sorry, that was a bit of a tangent <laughs> <laughs> from the Re- paper, the reactive oxygen species <laughs> Yes. Work. No, no, no. It was so interesting. I just wanted to uh, say a a couple more things about the reactive oxygen species yeah definitely and so uh they then went on to figure out whether whether the lack of sleep itself again was the cause of death or whether once again it was the reactive oxygen species so what they did was they added antioxidants and antioxidant enzymes Ah, to see what effect it would have and whether it would allow the animals to 
uh, have a longer lifespan, including the lack of sleep. And they did that and it worked. So these animals, they um, even sleep deprived, their physiological responses re return to a healthy level. The gut returned to a healthy level. The, the cells in the gut are very good at regenerating. And so it was good. And, and then they, they did further experiments which showed <laughs> that taking antioxidants in general won't just you know magically improve your physiological state or your or your your gut state uh, these antioxidants are very contextual so they only um act in the way that the, you need you need them to act if there is present reactive oxidant species because what they do is they neutralize the these valence electrons and and so just to point out that taking antioxidants for the sake of <laughs> antioxidants won't like improve your lifespan or anything like that. It, it's oh, very contextual. No. I was actually thinking that as I was, no. as I was doing this research, I was like, the key to life is just antioxidants. <laughs> no, they only work if you already have reactive oxygen, reactive but, oxygen but do they species. Have, they don't have negative effects if you no, don't. No, no, they don't, they don't. So... But they just, it's like taking vitamins. Once you yeah. reach your limit, like... You can have more, but yeah. it's not going to do anything. But definitely this this is a key idea of like sleep being antioxidant mm. and the bi-directional relationship with, uh, between sleep and these biochemical reactions mm -hmm. because like sleep is antioxidant, but then I also read that oxidative stress is a trigger of sleep. So basically ah. like the need to sleep is linked to yeah. the accumulation of this oxidative stress. It, it makes sense. I think they did say that when, when, the, uh, when the animals were really sleep deprived, um, that yeah, they, they would sleep and then they would regenerate and then they would have to sleep deprive them even more in order to build up that reactive oxidant species again. Yeah. Um, you know what, curiously enough, is a, re is a really good um, antioxidant? Rebus. No. <laughs> I didn't know that, but okay. <laughs> Sorry, that, pro that probably sounded so random, but we were just talking about rebus tea, mm -hmm. and it is apparently like its main benefit is antioxidation. That's <laughs> nice. <laughs> but sorry, what were you going to say? So, <laughs> tying very nicely with the fact that sleep deprivation causes reactive oxygen species, a wonderful antidote is melatonin. Oh. Melatonin is known as an antioxidant. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> But it's just such an incredible <laughs> puzzle, how it just all fits together. Yes. Isn't it? It just works so well. It works so beautifully. Mm -hmm. And um, and, they, and they show that when uh, there's sleep deprivation, that over time there's less melatonin and therefore less antioxidants and consequently more reactive oxygen species. Yeah. So, yeah, back to, again, sleep serving a primarily metabolic function. Mm -hmm. Yes, what I find interesting, of course, is like the evolution mm -hmm. of sleep across <laughs> species. And um, first, firstly, if sleep is primarily metabolic, then where do we draw the line of plants undergo rhythms of metabolism? Like photosynthesis occurs yes. during the day, takes a break at night, and also plants synthesize melatonin. So maybe this functions in the same way to like alter oxidation. Oh my god, maybe. Yeah. That'd be so interesting to look into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's switch from being neuroscientists to studying Study plants. plants. Yes. <laughs> plants have a brain. We're like halfway there. We're already so into fungi. So <laughs> that's true. Just and enzymes. <laughs> um, but yeah, so where do we draw the line of what we consider as sleep? And also the fact that though now sleep has functions in the brain too, such as memory consolidation, mm -hmm. if you haven't yet checked out that episode, yes. <laughs> these may have evolved mm -hmm. as like together with the evolution of a, a brain structure as part of the nervous system. And I was thinking that since the brain has additional functions of interoception mm. and top-down control of 
some autonomic functions, which yes. we also mentioned in the breathing episode. Yes. When you mentioned about sleep, dreaming being like top down control, but also autonomic. Yes. And you mentioned yes. dreaming being like lucid dreaming. Yeah, being mm-hmm. like an autonomic function in a way. Yeah. But also c- controllable. So yes. I was, anyways, I was just thinking do we as humans with the brain, do we have more top down control of how our sleep can affect us? Interesting. Yeah, so it's like developing this new function for sleep. Oh. Yeah. Do you mean as in terms of like whether or not we're in charge of our own sleep deprivation? Yes, in terms of whether or not we control both our sleep rhythms, but also like how sleep affects our mental state, I guess. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. This balance between autonomic systems as well as our own volition and control over them. And how this may have evolved. Um, Across Yeah, species. in a way, this is a great... It way to gain insights into like how new cognitive functions arose. A- arose. Sleep being most probably originally metabolic and biochemical mm-hmm. to turning into cognitive. Cognitive, yeah. Um, hope you've enjoyed listening to this podcast on sleep and that you'll have. A very well rested night tonight <laughs> yes. and uh, neutralize all of your reactive oxygen species that you've built up throughout the day. Don't due forget to oh, sorry. metabolism and ATP synthesis. <laughs> Don't forget to drink your rubious, rubious tea. Yes. <laughs> I still struggle to pronounce it so much. And, and uh, also take your melatonin. And vitamins and any on- antioxidants. Take care of yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hope you enjoyed listening to this episode.